New products, new, new, new. New, 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 yeah. new, 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 All right. new, new, new. Let's get through these really fast. I could start. You made a sticker. We've got Raspberry Pi stickers. These are official and approved from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. A portion of each sale goes to the Raspberry Pi Foundation. We got permission. Awesome. We're making stickers. Um, they're a buck. really nice. They're, they're vinyl. Dollar. They're yeah, vinyl they're color beautiful. stickers. They'll last forever. Here's my laptop. And they also, you can put them on stuff and remove it, and it won't like it won't like leave the annoying sticky yeah. residue. So you can like move it around. Yeah. Next up. This is the uh, Papercraft uh, Lunar Landers that have LEDs lit up. Sparkle and, uh, yeah, it's from Sparkle. Sparkle Lab. They're super cute. They're like and a fun little project if you want to do a non-soldering electronics project. They're safe. They're you know non-toxic, yeah. no soldering. John, you took this photo. Uh, what did you have to do? This is a beautiful white background. Actually, I, I can't take credit for that. That was um, the Sparkle Labs folks did that because that art on the left is too amazing for me to have ever done. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah they had good photos. Oh, okay. So we, we were doing it and then we found those and we were like, wow. <laughs> so Ariel, who's there, is a fantastic designer here, and he has yeah. a, yeah, a wonderful a I, I thought this one was These really were cool. a lot of fun, though, when we were, we were, uh, Becky and I were having craft time. Oh, awesome. And putting them together. Very cool. This is just a standard diffused white shot um, for something like that that would work really well. Okay. And hey, this then, is a so uh, is this. breadboard friendly MIDI jack. So we actually had a couple of these jacks left over from uh, previous projects. And we're like, hey, we should put these in the store. Um, it basically, your standard uh, five pin DIN MIDI uh, or DIN sync jack. Uh, and the nice thing about them is the pins are um, on a 0.1 inch uh, spacing. And so you can actually just plug this right into a breadboard or a perma proto and uh, go to town, none of the pins will uh, collide with any of the others, so you can just wire them up. And uh, we even linked to a, a great Arduino tutorial on how to make a MIDI controller out of an Arduino, because an Arduino makes a great MIDI controller. Uh, this project is a, a, a pretty simple product that we actually uh, had, we finally got to putting in the store. It's a PS2 keyboard adapter, so you can plug a PS2 keyboard into it, and it has a little microcontroller and it will spit a TTL serial output. So if you have something that, you know, PS2 is a, is a bit of a time sensitive uh, protocol. You actually have to sit and wait for the keyboard to send you interrupts. Um, but the nice thing is instead of that, you can have this which buffers the data and then sends it out as like ASCII text. So that can be kind of convenient if you're just, uh, you know, trying to get a keyboard attached to something. Okay. We also have uh, this fabulous new Perma Proto. This is a, a special Perma Proto that's a, um, Promo Proto Pi, and basically uh, people were asking like, well, I have um, like a cobbler and a breadboard, and then you know I have this project, but now I want to finish the project and, and finalize it, and uh, they were like, it's actually kind of hard to connect the Raspberry Pi to a Promo Proto because the pins are like, you have to get a cobbler and solder and complicated. So what we did is we actually took um, a, a Promo Proto, <clears throat> and then I'll uh, I'll show them the overhead because it's. It's a, little, it's a little unusual what we did here, but we took the Perma Proto, which is a standard sort of breadboard layout thing going on here. Oh, hold on, sorry. And then um, over here, we, we stopped it, and then we put basically kind of a cobbler with a lot of breakouts. And so it comes with this connector, and you just have to solder this connector in. And then you can plug in your um, Raspberry Pi project into here, and then you can use wires to connect from the, these breakouts to the uh, power rails or to the pins over here. So it kind of combines a, a uh, Raspberry Pi cobbler breakout with a breadboard breakout. And we'll have these in different sizes, but the first size we got in stock is the full size. So that kind of explains what that's up. And, and check the photos, because there's a big photo showing all the pins and the very okay. nice silk screen that we got. Next up, we've got We've got two servos. I'll actually show um, the big servo on the overhead. These are. Oh, did you take this photo? I did, yes. I did. These okay. are really cool motors, too. Yeah. These are servos that are Metal Gear servos, not to be confused with Metal Gear Solid, which <laughs> I played on the PlayStation, and that was an awesome game. This is different. These are servos, and um, inside, I can show, um, usually servos are, that are lower cost. They use a plastic, usually a, a mix of plastic and metal or plastic gears. Um, this, first off, it has a, a huge motor, really nice big DC motor, and uh, a nice well-made control board here. And then here you can see that these gears, they're a little gray because they have oil on them. Um, they're, they're greased, but um, it's a full metal gear train, which makes this extremely high torque, um, very strong. This is really good for robotics. They're a little bit more expensive and they're a little heavier because of these uh, solid brass gears. And uh, there's very nice bushing here. There's a, a nice uh, full metal bushing. 
also not to be confused with a full metal jacket, which is a great movie by Kubrick. Um, <laughs> so we've got this both in the large size. I took this apart with screws. It's really nice. You can, you can actually open it very easily and uh, work on it. Um, or you can also get it in the micro size, which I have somewhere here. It'll be upgraded to titanium gears. Um, that will be a $50 servo. So, but um, it is a little heavy. I agree that the, the brass makes it a little bit heavy. It comes with a full selection of horns as well. Okay. All right. And moving right along, um, we've got this. And now this is where we're getting the John trick. Look at this beautiful photo. Yeah, that's a great photo. So this yeah, is basically, it's kind of interesting. It's a, um, they are a little bit expensive, but these are these like totally awesome, um, totally weatherproof, um, uh, sonar modules and uh, the cool thing about this is that you can put this on an outdoor project and they're designed for only detecting large objects um, and it does all the computation for you um, they're in this nice potted uh, compound yeah let me just say we basically got these for Chris Cartwright with a snow blowing uh, Raspberry Pi powered it was a, uh, it was a good uh, idea uh, bot, so. yeah, can, you show, can you show it really fast yeah, yeah, I want to yeah. show it um, on video uh, oh, oh that's me hi sorry uh, close. Uh, yeah, so it, it has this nice um, horn also to direct um, and, and make sure that it only points in the direction of, of where it's trying to measure. Uh, it's potted background and it's got this thread so you can put an O-ring and make this fully waterproof. Uh, check the data sheet for the, the specific distribution because it has a range and an angle. And then on the back there's uh, like six different pins so you can have like serial output, analog output. I switch the output. There's a lot of different outputs. So this is a really nice, uh, good range um, sonar module. So this is a nice collection to our, our uh, Maximotic right. sonar. So this was the first product photo I took was for this product. Yeah, this is yeah. nice. And so tell us, how did you how did you pull this off? Because it looks like it's in like a, a magic land that's computer generated. How did you do this? Yeah, it looks, yeah. Like, it looks like a 90s uh, land. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Scoot up, up to the mic. Um, okay. So basically, uh, for this shot, there's, um, there's a table. So I'll kind of I'll show you with my hands. So there's a table here. This is where the object is. There's a light underneath it um, with a with a grid to restrict its its fall off so that it makes that sort of radial pattern like in the back. Yeah. And that's under the table pointing at the background, which is just a neutral gray. Then there's a, another light above, uh, off to the left slightly. It's just a um, a large soft box. And basically that's what I did. You, you, you kind of have to play around to get the light matching so that you don't blow out the background and at the same time you don't want the background to be too dark because then that kind of defeats the purpose of this sort of glorious it, halo around the object. It's very difficult to take photos. When I took photos, it's hard to take photos of things that are white or neutral colored. Because, yeah, it's, it's, because either you have a black background and then it looks really harsh, mm -hmm. or it's a white background and then like you have nice shadows but I would never be able to get really good shadows. So it would be just like totally blown out. It's so, hard to give the things definition, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. like it's because it's like a very it's like a totally neutral gray color, right? And there's it's yeah. smooth. So too. Yeah, here's my question: How much post did you have to do, like Photoshop and color correcting, after you're done with the photo? On this, I don't, I don't really think I had to do a lot, um, yeah. as long as you get the exposure correct. And, and really, the the biggest rule of digital photography is, is check your histogram religiously, because mm -hmm. that's got all the information you need on whether you've got a good exposure or not. Do um, so you want to see like a good yeah. like? Yeah. You want to see basically, yeah, you want to see maybe a peak in the middle and yeah. off to either side, but not where it's obvious that you have data that's clipping at the, at the high end and being lost at the low end. That's a good tip. You want to kind of keep it and you also don't want, And you also don't want it to be like dropped off too fast. You want it to be like a nice spread, right? Or like you, yeah, want to, you want to have There it are like some things that, that don't work well for that where, where there's only like certain fixed tonalities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but something like this where you have so much gradation, you would have, in fact, like a nice Great smooth, scale, yep. yeah. It would look like a, like a... So there's already a ton of requests. I'll just summarize. Everybody would love a like Adafruit learning system tutorial on like how you shot like one photo like that. Okay. You know, in a tip. So, uh, John, like you have this. some homework. <laughs> I like this because they have, they have a little bit of soul, right? Because like my photos tend to be like part on a white background, but this is like, it's three dimensional. Like you see it, mm -hmm. you yeah. know? Yeah, you, you can sort of sense what it what it would feel like in your hand and, and right you know. and the texture yeah you, okay. you get a sense. okay so anyway, speaking of here's another one in that same type of series like look at this this is, a this is awesome this is it the, totally it's funny because it looks fake this is the clear <laughs> raspberry pi cases we got and we call these the uh it's not fake i was the, there the, the pie, pie shells. shells 
And right. uh, here they are just without the pie in them. And then I want to show Boring. I want to show this is my favorite one. This is, looks like the muffler off a Tron cycle fell off or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know. That's right. And this is what the, it looks like uh, off of it, of course. But um, both, both look good. I, I, I mean, of course, it, it looks totally awesome. It's like the monolith here. So it looks like yeah. it's reflective. Oh. How, is, is, that, is that a Photoshop effect? How'd you get that reflection? Uh, it's actually sitting on a piece of black plexiglass. It's okay. from the monochrome clock. Way, way easier than way uh, easier. Photoshop. In fact, I, I, you know, black... Is that what they use? Is that official? Like people use acrylic? Because acrylic is quite shiny. It is. Uh, in, in most studios, though, you don't really use it because you can't use it for very long. It gets scratches on it, and it really starts it to show. Yeah. So the better option is to use something like privacy glass, like a sunroof type glass, uh -huh. um, or sometimes the skyscraper glass, but not the mirrored kind, just yeah. the regular. But you just were like, "Hey, I'm going to go to the laser yeah. and grab some scrap." Grab yeah. some scrap, yeah, and because um, I, I just wanted to. Sort of, when it's brand new, it looks really, really good. So yeah, it's, it's smooth and then there. like one fingerprint, it's like ah, as you can yeah, see. Yeah, you can right. clean it with a microfiber cloth, but eventually even that starts to show. I have scratches. the Novus stuff. The Novus, but yeah, you know, but mm -hmm. like it's like you're, why are you spending an hour polishing five dollars of acrylic? Like, yeah, kind of a little crazy. The other nice thing with with the glass is it's a little heavier, so it, it sort of whereas the plexi kind of moves it, around. It does bend, yeah. yeah. And it okay. warps too. So you you put it, you did the same sort of thing. We have a f light underneath shining at this neutral background, and that how gives it that sort of like sunrise effect. Yep. And it's sitting on top of black. Acrylic. Yeah. There's actually uh, this with three lights in this scene where you have the. Um, I'll show you. I'll show the people, folks at home. So it was sitting like, like this, and basically I had a light underneath the table shooting this way, and then I had another light up here, and then I had another uh, strip softbox over here. As you can see, if you go back to the photo, um, well, where'd it go? There it goes. Yeah. There's this like slight line on the right side, yeah. like a, a bright spot. Yeah. Yeah. So it gives it some def definition over there. So I put a little strip box. Zoom in here a little bit so people can see. You can kind of see it. It's it's yeah. in there. I do see. Yeah, like the HDMI connector. It seems a little brighter than yeah, it sh I, should be. That was uh, yeah, before. Yeah, you can see how normally there would have been a shadow that hides it, but then instead mm -hmm. it just yeah. added a little bit of light to, to bring out that connector. Yeah. All right. So and that's now, how I did both of these. The star of the show, I think tonight, besides John Deere and Lady Ada, is this new product. This is the Adafruit NeoPixel 60 LED per meter strip. Yeah, we have some right here. It's been sitting here. The it's big amazing. That's why I so let's so uh, let me just uh, let me show you the chip on this. Yeah, these are really interesting. So and for a long uh, time, like we, we've carried the 32 LED per meter, and it's it's basically like simple, low cost. Yeah. And um, the thing that's nice about the 32 LED per meter stuff is um, it's SPI ish, which means that any microcontroller can use it. Like mm -hmm. pretty much, people have ported my code to um, like the Netduino, the Basic Stamp, the Propeller, like. You know, probably even AVR. 851 or something. Yeah, everything, ARM, everything. Uh, you know, Raspberry Pi, we got it working. Yep. Um, and then, you know, we've had that for a while, and then our people were asking for higher density LED strip. People wanted more LEDs per um, per meter, and um, that you know, for making like high density displays, or you know, they want something that looks good. And they also wanted something that was thinner, and this stuff is thinner. Um, so we found this really interesting LED strip, and the cool thing about this LED strip is if you look at this photo, I can't show it on the overhead because the overhead will not be able to display Dominate it. Dominate the overhead. Yeah, it'll, it'll, it's, it's too bright, but if you look at the photo that we have of the chip, the LED itself, the way they get the high density is that there's no chip. That usually there's a chip and then LED and chip and LED, but the thing is if you do that, there's like a maximum density of like about 40 LEDs per meter. You can't, mm -hmm. you can't actually shove more stuff on a single sided strip because you have to have these, these cut points. So what's interesting is that this LED strip has the um, LED chip inside of the LED. So the controller chip is in the LED and so the LED instead of being like red, green, blue, it's actually mm -hmm. power ground input output and then there's um, one pin that's not used and then one pin that's another power pin for the LEDs. And so um, there's some good things about this and some bad things. The good thing is you get this ultra high density. The bad thing is that um, you don't have two pins uh, for input and output. Instead, you have only um, one pin for input and output, and it uses um, sort of a pulse coding system to set the, yep. the colors. And it's and it's full 8-bit per LED, so it's like 24-bit color, um, which is which is awesome. But um, the the trade-off is you cannot use this with a microcontroller that does not or a computer that does not have precision timing output. 
has to be 100 nanoseconds or better precision timing app, but it has to be repeatable. So that means you can use it with an Arduino because it's real time. Mm -hmm. You turn off interrupts and you've got, you know, when you set the, the pin high, the pin goes high immediately. You can also use it with a propeller because you can use a core to do that. Right. You can also use it with any pick, um, like ARM Cortex microcontrollers and stuff. However, you cannot use it with a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino or basic stamp because these are interpreted uh, computer platforms. The basic stamp mm -hmm. interprets the basic. It's it's too slow. Uh, the net we know also it does interpretive .net. And yeah, you you're you're cannot, not close enough to the metal. It's not metal. real SPI. You can't with SPI. It's different. Because <laughs> it has to be faster. It has to be faster. You can't it can't interpret the instruction. It only it does like one kilohertz or couple kilohertz output. You need much much faster. You need like a, a megahertz output to, to to pulse this out. And the Raspberry Pi has an operating system that interrupts. Uh, the background. Now, if somebody wanted to, they could probably write a kernel module that would drive this. However, I'm pretty busy. I'm not going to do it. Somebody else might do it. Um, you could if you wanted to. You <laughs> could if you wanted to. Raspberry Pi does have the ability to do um, that, but it, not in user space. It is a, a, a serious amount of work, right. uh, not yeah. for a noob or beginner. Yeah. Um, but yes. Not a lot of heat on these, but it's warm. Yeah, another thing to watch out for is because of the high density, you need a really good power supply. Because with the other ones, you could use like, you know, 2 amp power supply and get away with driving a couple meters. This, you need a 10 amp power supply to drive it. This stuff is super, super bright, super dense. Let's maybe check it out on the overhead real fast. Yeah. So I can show off. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be a little bright, but we can show it off. So, um, what you can see is, um, yeah, there's LEDs, and then you can see the connector dividers in between, and this lovely color output. And so, I'm just doing a rainbow uh, sweep here. Um, but yeah, it's, it's super bright. They are as bright as the other LED strip. We don't have an exact data sheet for the LEDs. I'm still working on it. I wanted to get this in the store, but uh, it is hella bright. John, how do you even begin to photograph or film these? You just can't. You can only be shown them. <laughs> How do you do it? Yeah, I mean, you, you kind of, geez, you, you kind of have to decide what's most important to you and sort of throw everything else out because there's no way. <laughs> Church and family. Yeah. No, yeah. I don't know. Baby bathwater. <laughs> yeah. You, well, you kind of. There's no way that I can. I can really show what this kind of looks like because I'm basically using a photograph uh, of reflected light, and this thing is generating its own light. Yeah. So it, it's it's kind of hard. What we kind of went for was I wanted to make sure that all the colors were represented uh, clearly. You sort of a bit again with the white background actually makes it more difficult because you're shooting on white and and white is the brightest color. Why don't you shoot? Why not shoot on black? Or you just you can try that. You could shoot it on black. Black is a little difficult too. Gray is is probably a little bit easier. Um, and I may actually redo this on gray. Yeah. It's tough because our eyes, like, it's really bright, yeah. but it's very hard to it, show how bright it is because if it's too bright, it, it blows it out, and if it's too dim, like, it looks washed out. Right. The other, the other problem is, I mean, just the difference between, like, a pixel and the space between the pixel. Yeah. It's so, the dynamic range is so high that there's no, no yeah. camera, digital camera that can actually capture that. Yeah. Film might be able to do it. But yeah, humans are cool. We can actually see Yeah, that. we have really, really wide dynamic we have range a lot of in our vision, vision system. So one quick question. Someone wants to know, uh, would you be able to uh, hook up 200 strips together? I guess if you had enough power. You can, it's basically <laughs> a power thing and a timing thing. I think with... Um, 500 pixels, you can do 30 frames a second. I think I calculated it out. Um, you can do that. You can do the math. Make a TV. But, but you, you, know, you, you can drive. As, you know, you can chain as many as you want. Um, the problem is, is that like the more you chain, of course, you have to write the whole strip at once. It does. It does take longer. Uh, you have to inject 10 amps of power into every four meters of LED strip. It comes on a four yeah. meter strip uh, thing. Or you can cut it up and, and inject power in multiple places. That's what usually people do when they make really big arrays of this LED strip is they inject power. That's that's what you're going to be uh, killed on. Also, you need a lot of RAM to buffer um, the display. You need three bytes per LED, and you have to buffer the entire strand in memory. So um, something like a Mega would be a really good choice for, you know, if you wanted to do a big display.